Mark Sargent likes to direct people to his well-known video series, Flat Earth Clues. It's a documentation he did of the research he undertook when he first started looking into Flat Earth. Unfortunately, they leave a lot to be desired, and we're going to pick apart another one today, something which I think ruins the Flat Earth completely. Flight times. <laughs> Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining me for another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Before we begin today, I'm delighted to announce that today's episode is brought to us by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online community with thousands of classes covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. Premium membership gives you unlimited access so you can join classes and communities which you think are just right for you. Whether you want to fuel your curiosity, creativity or career, Skillshare is the perfect place to keep you learning and thriving. If, like me, you don't have much time in your hands and you're forever flying by the seat of your pants, then this Productivity Masterclass course could be just for you. 10 lessons of organisational know-how that really helps with your overall productivity. And it's affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes or workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, you can sign up with the link on screen and I'll also pop it in the description, which gives you two months free for a trial. Right, back to Mr. Mark Sargent, and in his Flat Earth Clues Part 7, he wants to talk about long haul flights. Perfect, because I think these ruin any chance for a Flat Earth at all. Flat Earth Clues Part 7, The Long Haul. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue looks into a topic I only glanced at in the original guide, which is the southern hemisphere, or in the flat earth model, the land masses closest to the outer ring. So the outer ring being what flat earthers think Antarctica is. I like to give credit where credit is due, and the long haul title was given to me by a fellow flat earther who did some of the same research I did. The summary of the video is this. If you are looking to show someone how to view the flat earth from a practical point of view, this is the example I would use. A practical point of view? Practical? Right, this should be good. I'm going to show you how strange the world looks using just a few websites, some simple math, a couple minutes, and your brain. You don't have to write anything down, unless you want to, of course. I'll give you everything you need on screen and break down one of the examples as well. I'll also link the sites in the description for reference. First, here are some websites that help you calculate distance. The GPS on your phone already does this, and you may have an app as well, but here are some dedicated examples. Uh, Timeanddate.com, tripit.com, distancefrom2.net, worldatlas.com, freemaptools.com, and travelmath.com. So he wants us all to be able to measure distance. Right, shouldn't be too hard. If your favorite isn't listed here, like Google Maps, then use whatever is most familiar to you. Now we are going to look at two specific groups of cities. The first group is going to be from the area around Australia, including New Zealand. We'll call this Group 1. Group 1 includes Melbourne, Australia, Sydney, Australia, Perth, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand, Christchurch, New Zealand, and Hamilton, New Zealand. If he's going the way I think he's going, he's in for some issues. Let's continue. The second group is going to be some cities in South America, all in the Southern Hemisphere. I mention this because if you go high enough, you will run into a few cities that won't work. He means it doesn't support the Flat Earth model, of course. Group 2 includes Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Brasilia, Brazil, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Lima, Peru, and Santiago, Chile. Right, we've got our cities. This should be interesting. Again, there is a link in the description with many other airports. Now, these two groups are interchangeable, as you would imagine, so you can start or end with either group one or two. The results will be the same, 
And just to make it interesting, I'll use a slightly different example which a fellow flat earther did the legwork on and show you that even these two groups aren't exclusive. So you take anything from group one and anything from group two and you get some distances ranging from six to eight thousand miles roughly. I'm happy with that so far. Easy stuff. That's all I want you to do here is get that part in your head. Noticing that the root is bent because they have to account for the curvature of the Earth. As I've discussed before, this route is based on a great circle. Flight paths are just a small section of a great circle. All these directions are what you would expect, a straight shot over the South Pacific Ocean. Now, just to prove it's not an exclusive route, instead of starting in, say, Rio and landing in Auckland, I'll start what should be the opposite side, in Cape Town, South Africa which is roughly the same distance on a globe Earth coming in at 7,300 miles. Notice on the map it's still a straight shot through the Indian Ocean and not crossing any countries. An easy route. Well, 7,300 miles is a long way. And back in 2015 when this video was released, the longest long haul commercial flight was only 8,500 miles. The source for that, I'll put the link in the description. I try to book my flight. For this example, we use travel math, but you can use whatever is easiest in your country, like Priceline, Expedia, Travelocity. It will make no difference because they're all tied to the same system. And this is when everything goes wrong. Well, that's your opinion, but I'm not convinced. So the first leg, the airlines don't send me due east, but instead shoot me 4,700 miles almost due north to Dubai okay, maybe we're just picking up people. Seems a bit excessive, but I'll go with it. I'm probably comfortable in my seat drinking vodka tonics anyway. And from Dubai, it should be a straight shot home to Auckland, right? Er, uh, no. Now they send me southeast to Melbourne, a mere 7,300 miles. And then finally a third leg from Melbourne to Auckland coming in at around 1,600 miles. A lot of flights have stops, it's not uncommon, and if the demand for Cape Town to Auckland isn't high, then why would you do a direct flight? But let's continue. I'm rounding up or down to make the math easier. Regardless, the total miles for this flight is almost double what should be expected, coming in at 13,600 miles. In addition, the trip took me 37 hours. How long should it have taken? Well, in a 777 about 12. Now this is where you come in and say, well, it's probably an isolated incident or some strange connection thing. You know how the airlines are. I'm not going to say that, but what I am going to say is this. After a quick search with the same flight details, I found an alarming coincidence. Singapore Airlines stops at Singapore. Qatar Airways stops in Qatar. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the airline that Mark Sargent was checking was Emirates. Now, why would Emirates Airlines stop over in Dubai? Hmm, I wonder. Oh no, my friends. We can do this all day. This roulette table is rigged, and there is no way to get a fair game. The first part of the clue is the utter lack of non-stop flights from anywhere in this hemisphere, which is why I gave you multiple cities in each group. And here's the plot hole for you. Flying from international cities like Sydney, Rio, Santiago, or anywhere else close by, you can't get a single non-stop flight, no matter how much money you pay. I tried to do this for an entire night. Well, you didn't try very hard, because I found this in two minutes. Sydney to Santiago, non-stop with Qantas. And it was like playing an online casino game, one that I was losing most of the time. The connections kept coming in like spam windows. Start in Christchurch, go to Auckland. Start in Auckland, go to Sydney. Start in Sydney, go to Dubai or Los Angeles or somewhere else that makes no sense. Apart from the fact that the airline involved was probably from the stopover country. Some of these connections took the trip over 50 hours to complete. Go ahead, try it yourself. You may find one non-stop. Oh, hang on. So you're saying that you've been all night looking for one and couldn't find one, and now you're saying that you may find one. Now, Mark, come on. 
you found one, didn't you? And this matters because just finding that one flight direct blows your entire argument apart. But even then, the strangeness doesn't end there because the speed is wrong. For reference, I included an optimum cruising speed guide from a commercial pilot's forum that lists all the international aircraft used in these routes. A 777, the current state-of-the-art flagship plane, designed for maximum fuel efficiency, has a cruising speed of 640 miles an hour. 7,400 miles comes in at around 12 hours. Here comes his maths. Let's hope it's better than his research skills. Try to find this route. It doesn't exist. It can't. The closest I came was a one-connection flight with a three-hour layover. The total flight time was 20 hours. 20 take away 3 is 17, not 12. And this might work if the plane was doing, say, 430 miles an hour. But it's not. In fact, the slowest cruising speed I found was an older Airbus just around 593. There are a lot more variables that Mark hasn't considered here. Would a plane be constantly doing its cruising speed? How long would it take to get to cruising speed? How long would it take to slow down to landing speed? Is the flight path going against a jet stream? Etc, etc. But this is all just numbers, right? It is until you pull up the flat earth map and look at the farthest two points, which just coincidentally are anywhere in Australia and most of South America. Or my example of Lower Africa, which you can see isn't west at all. It's a shell game, and a very good one at that. Keep people guessing with multiple connections and layovers, jumping from city to city. People just sit in their seats, trying to sleep through it. And then it hits you. Well, the pilots would know, right? They fly all day every day. Certainly, they would have figured it out by now. Some of them would get suspicious, sure. Any decent navigator will be able to work out the speed, fuel consumption, and odd connections. But imagine what they would have to get their head around. First, they would have to ignore the world GPS system that has been leading them to their destinations without error. You mean the GPS system that works because of the satellites in space? That GPS system? If you want some interesting side reading, check out the link on the history of the GPS. And I quote, Developed in 1973 to overcome the limitations of previous navigation systems, integrating ideas from several predecessors, including a number of classified engineering design studies from the 1960s, oh, and by the way, was created by the Department of Defense, the same people that closed off Antarctica. So GPS and the Antarctic Treaty are tools used by the government. Right. So when I do a run, how does my little old running watch know where I am? And it doesn't always work because I'm not always in view of enough satellites. So I turned on this little thing in my watch that means I can increase the amount of satellites. It's called GLONASS. It's basically the Russian version of GPS. It essentially means that now there are more satellites available to try and find me. And guess what? It finds me every time now. GPS went fully live in 1995, so if you were a pilot before then, you might have been able to pick up a breadcrumb trail. After that, very difficult. Plus, let's say you did figure out that something was off. Who exactly would you tell? The FAA? You would be looking around and wondering why you were the only one to see it. And then what? You make the leap of faith and see that the entire map system is wrong? Never going to happen. You might as well just tell them that an alien spacecraft followed your plane around for two hours. We know what happens then. Start playing Flight Time Casino for yourself. See what interesting things you can discover. And while you're at it, show it to any pilots that you know. But don't forget to leave the words Flat Earth out. Because that's crazy, right? So do some of your own research and ask questions. Please feel free to email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or 303-494-6631. Except it's not, is it, Mark? And I think you know that. Which brings me to an open challenge for you, Mark. And I've used this one before, but I'm gonna do it again. If I'm in Santiago, Chile, and I want to fly to Sydney with a distance of just over 11,000 kilometers, 
The flight takes me 14 hours, 20 minutes, non-stop. My friend, who's in Boston, Massachusetts, he wants to fly to Tokyo, a distance of just under 11,000 kilometers, and that takes him 13 hours, 50 minutes. Here are the two flights on your flat earth model. Why do they take similar times when one is almost double the distance on your flat earth map? Here is Mark Sargent's email address, which he makes public on every video that he does. Feel free to email him the same question. Right, that brings this episode of Flat Earth Friday to a lovely close, busting the Flat Earth clues wide open. If you enjoyed it, then please, please do like and subscribe. I have been Simon Dan, and I'll see you all on Sunday for another Science Top 5. See you then. <laughs>